Thank you very much, uh, Neelkan Mishra, Sajit Chanoy, Shomakanti Ghosh, Sanjeev Sanyal, and Professor Ram Mohan uh, for what I'm sure is going to be an extremely enriching discussion. Now, I have put up, uh, the topic is uh, moving towards a $5 trillion economy. Is $5 trillion a bit of a, uh, you know, tall ask? Sanjeev, let me start with you. I think you're basically a $5 trillion economy. As explained in the economic survey, we have a, uh, we have a subtext there that explains how we arrived at that number. Assumes that the terminal year of 24-25, we will have an exchange rate <coughs> of around 75 to the dollar. Then you basically need a nominal rupee growth rate of about 12% per year. Now obviously we have signed up for a 4% inflation rate. So effectively, we end up with slightly less than 8% GDP growth rate per year. Remember, it's compounded. So anyway, so that is the number. It's nothing very deep about it. Okay. The, and the reason for it, quite apart from the fact that it's a nice round number, is also that it would tie us as the world's third largest economy with Japan. So that is the source of the number. Obviously, it's a rough and ready number, but uh, the fact is, that uh, certainly the current slowdown will mean that the subsequent run rate goes up by whatever that uh, gap is. Uh, well, uh, maybe if time permitting, we'll come back to whether we can keep the dollar flat like it was between 2004 and 2009, uh, when uh, you know we had some advantages uh, uh, in terms of uh, crude price was rising. In 2004, it was uh, low, but it had risen by the time. We got to 2009, we had a, a, a comfortable current account. Uh, fiscal deficit, okay, at this point in time looks lower on paper, but uh, uh, there are extra budgetary borrowings. Uh, we'll come to that if we can compare whether we will look more like 2004 to 2009 or whether we will look, uh, you know, a, a, in a different factor. But the very fact that we are not reached up to that 12% uh, CAGR, the first uh, quarter of growth is 8%. Let's first diagnose the problem. We started by asking whether it was structural. Uh, would you want to identify, uh, Neil Kant, whether there are any structural issues that has brought the GDP to as low as 8%? Because as your report put it, 8% is a 15-year low. So we should be genuinely worried about that number. So uh, before we uh, <clears throat> assess what is happening now, so uh, let's see what is needed to get to 12% growth. And that will partly explain what is happening right now. See, uh, India's economy is about 56, 58 percent formal, right? Total credit to GDP is about 70 percent. 50 percent is banking, 20 percent is non-banking. Given that agriculture is largely informal but still gets some access to formal credit, let's assume that our debt to GDP, uh, the private sector debt to GDP is about 100 percent, right? Which is, uh, I think some countries are higher but that's not a bad ratio. And you assume that as you grow the economy by 12%, you're also increasing formalization. So formal debt has to grow in excess of nominal GDP, right? Which means that there should be at least 14 to 15%, if not 16, 17% growth in formal credit. But what is happening right now is that uh, the capacity of the financial system is now, uh, has, is not growing as fast. And we are already seeing that. So what we have seen in this 8% is, I think, significant amount of destocking. Uh, so when inventory builds up again, uh, I think you'll see a flare-up of growth. But this will only happen when there is adequate finance available. So if you assume that, say, the, the public sector banks grow at 9-10%, the private sector banks, I don't think, will grow beyond two times nominal GDP, so 22-24%. And the bond market is struggling, the NBFCs are struggling, even if they grow at 15%, to arrive at the fact that the PSU banks are going to grow slower means that there is almost a 35 trillion rupee shortfall in aggregate credit, which will be needed in uh, 2025. So your chart ends at 24, I think Sanjeev is right, should go to FY25. So by FY25, you need fresh financial capacity of 35 trillion. So what is happening right now, and the reason we have slowed is that first the PSU bank slowed, then NBFC's bond market came in. Now they have slowed, but no one is picking up the slack. And if the situation remains like this, 
then this could very much be the growth rate that we can have. Okay. So you're saying there is a structural issue in the financial sector which we have to resolve. So that is clearly structural and that's not a cyclical factor. I uh, agree and I totally agree with uh, Dr. what Dr. Reddy said just now that uh, we need to reassess the role of the PSU banks in for, the, for the future. Okay. All right. Um, um, uh, Dr. Mo, uh, uh, Ram Mohan, what is your assessment? If the financial sector, would you agree first that the financial sector is structurally constrained? And before we come to this public sector argument and whether it needs to be uh, denationalized or, uh, or the, uh, the, the terrain of the public sector needs to be crunched and private sector needs to be given more terrain, before that, uh, do you think that the NDFC space is becoming an issue which is uh, prolonging or deepening the slowdown? And therefore, do we need, is that one of the most immediate reforms? Maybe an FRDI bill which only looks at the NDFC sector? Uh, because the banking sector, you know, we, ha we had all these bail-in problems and it became, uh, you know, politically difficult. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, something immediate needs to be done? If yes, what? Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, it is very substantially uh, financial sector related problem at the moment. I mean, the immediate problem that we are seeing, I mean, there could be a whole lot of uh, structural issues. And as people have said, in general, there could be a combination of cyclical and structural factors, as Dr. Reddy also emphasized. But I think, uh, to me, the surprising thing is that people are surprised that uh, there is a slowdown of this sort. Because I think around this time last year, people were talking of a Lehman moment, you know, sometime in September or October. And when it didn't happen in September, October, they said we should expect something in the following May. And May uh, uh, came and went, and we still didn't, didn't see a Lehman moment. Uh, so when you talk of a Lehman moment, we are some talking about an impact on the economy, which is quite close to being catastrophic. And instead of that, if you see a slowdown of this magnitude, I think we must to be thankful for. So my own uh, view is that it is v at the moment, it is very substantially uh, the result of the problems in the financial sector. What we are going through is a banking crisis which has since spread to the non-banking sector. And this is not a classical banking crisis where you, know, you have multiple bank failures because of public sector dominance and the backing of the sovereign. You don't have the failure of banks and therefore you don't have that sort of impact on the real economy. But it is a banking crisis nevertheless. And if you look at uh, you know, the famous studies uh, on the time period it takes for nations to come out, economies to come out of banking crisis, which is, you know, the Reinhardt and yeah. Rogoff study. On the average, it takes at least about eight years for an economy to come out of a banking crisis. The banking system has largely recognized its NPA, and now the amount of NPAs is uh, falling. So, I mean, would you still call it a crisis? The crisis was past tense. Haven't we recognized and provided? Of course, they've not been resolved, the, the bad assets. No, the fact that the resolution of the crisis has begun doesn't mean that the crisis is over. So it's still early days in the resolution of the crisis. It has to work itself out. So if you mark, say, 2011-12 as the year of the uh, onset of the crisis, so thereafter NPA started rising, and if you allow for a time period of eight years, I think the earliest you would expect some sort of improvement to happen, which is something like 2020. And therefore, uh, the way the uh, crisis has played out and the sort of impact that we're seeing doesn't come as a big surprise to me. Okay. Uh, you're saying, therefore, the way the financial sector uh, uh, went, from, uh, went through its NPA crisis, you're not surprised about the slowdown? Yes. Uh, okay, yeah, so now this has, we've gone back to diagnosis. Uh, Milken started with prescription and that's why, uh, I mean, okay, your diagnosis is that it's largely a financial sector problem. Is it not also a real sector problem in the sense uh, is there not a problem of savings rate as well? Low income, low savings, is not that a structural issue? Absolutely. So uh, in India over the last decade, we've always said the constraints on structurally on the supply side, right? Infrastructure, power. Neil Kant rightly says the financial sector. I'm going to say we're actually now facing some structural constraints on the demand side. What do I mean by that? Um, if you look at consumption in the last five or six years, right, it's grown very rapidly. But it's grown not because of high income growth, despite high income growth. I'll give you two numbers that we look at closely. We have a lot of incredibly disaggregated data on rural wages. 
Last six years, real rural wages have grown at 0.9% a year. Yet, consumption of non-durables has grown at 6.5% a year, which is the proxy for rural consumption. So what you're seeing is income growth has softened, consumption growth has been very elevated. You see this in the RBI latest survey where they say, what is your spending perception, which is elevated? What's your income perception, which has been falling for five, six years, right? The counterpart of this is consumer debt. There's a great recent study by Sybil which shows household debt has gone up by 5% of GDP over the last five years. So for me, the issue is now some part supply, but a large part also demand. So let's go back to first principles. On the expenditure side, there's consumption, investment, government spending, X minus some exports, right? Over the last five years, one constraint was leverage on corporate balance sheets. So investment credit was low. The government filled in admirably in the last four or five years. Now we know that the total public sector borrowing requirement is almost 10% of GDP, so there's a constraint on how much the government can do. What was driving growth was consumption. And with household balance sheets now in considerably less well shaped than five, six years ago, the minute you have an income shock like we have for a year now, what happens? Because you've dipped into savings, which are six percentage points lower, because debt to GDP is higher, households in India will do what they did around the world, build up precautionary savings or cut back on consumption. So my worry is until wage growth or employment growth picks up sustainably, even if there's a cyclical bounce back to some consumption, we cannot go back to the seven, eight, nine percent consumption that we took as granted in India. That for me is one structural thing. Last thing I'll say, Lata, to finish the C plus I plus G, one revealing statistic which is not there is, in your 2004 to nine period, what drove growth? Exports grew at 18% a year for five successive years. The last five years, they've grown at 4%. So if exports are gonna be structurally constrained, Corporate balance sheets are getting better slowly, and you've got a household leverage problem. That, for me, is the key challenge for growth in the next few years. Well, uh, so that is uh, uh, part cyclical, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the structure of the financial sector also is a problem. Uh, Shavya, your, your final assessment on diagnosis of what brought growth so slowly, and then we will start with prescriptions. Uh, see, I think... Uh, 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 in the last five years, if you look into some of the data points, I think I'll also bring the household savings into um, the one of what are the reasons because we recently did a study on that. The most important thing is basically apart from the rural wage growth, which is now in real terms closer to now nil almost, if you look into the bad corporate wage growth of 4,000 to 5,000 listed companies, the peak at some point of time, if I remember in 2019, it was at 27 or 29%. Today that number is less than 10%. Similar terms in the rural wage growth, which was in the high 20s, is now close to almost 0.1% or 0.2%. So that's the income part. Now, part of it is because we are bantingly targeting inflation. So, so the point is, the important thing to know is that the rural wage growth, apart from the wage growth, the urban wage growth is also a problem because the first thing is that we are not producing good quality jobs. We are producing jobs, but that uh, jobs which are producing are not of high wages. So that is actually leading to a stagnation in income, and that is being, and given the fact that corporates are deleveraging, so we can see a substantial deceleration in the wage growth if we just pick up the listed companies 4,000 to 5,001. So that is one part. That is, of course, leading to an, to maintain the same level of expenditure, people are dipping into savings. But there is another factor which we actually recently found out is that one of the other factors which is crucially failing at the household savings of decline is the high real interest rate. Because what, what happens is that when the real inter there are empirical evidence in the Indian literature, in the, in the studies, which shows that there are two Im op impacts of household savings, basically real interest rates. One is the substitution impact, one is the wealth impact. What is possibly happening is that because the wage growth of the consumers is not going up to that extent, the income effect is outweighing the substitution effect in the long run, and that is leading to a decline in the household savings. And the other factor which I want to mention over here is that, just a small misconception is that, yes, household savings are import, uh, declined, but the composition, if you look into it, is the physical savings which have declined by around 600 basis points rather than the financial savings which had taken a dip after 2016-17 because of the currency crisis. So my 
take is that we are in interesting times because wage growth cannot go up to the level of 20% which you are witnessing prior to the crisis. We, so, so that is one thing. The other thing is that we need to understand ke how we need to park up the household savings which have declined more because of this downturn in the real estate sector and physical savings taking a more, more, I mean, uh, more hit rather than the financial savings part.